Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is the first year manager of the Memphis Redbirds, Mike Schultz. <laughs> On December 10th of last year, 46-year-old Mike Schilt was named the sixth manager in the 18-year history of the Memphis Redbirds. Schilt, who replaces Pop Warner, has worked in the Cardinals organization for 12 years, including the last three as skipper of their AA Springfield affiliate. In 2012, he led the team to a Texas League championship. He also led Johnson City to a league title. The Redbirds are just two weeks away from their exhibition battle with the parent Cardinals on April 3rd. And the season opener, set for April 9th, is also rapidly approaching. Today, Mike Schilt joins me to talk about his new job, his role as a minor league skipper, and he tells us what the Cardinals way means to him. And it's all next on Sports 5. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations and welcome to Memphis. Well, thank you very much. I'm excited. When did you first know that you were going to take over the Redbirds? I found out in Instructional League, uh, middle of October of 2014. So what's going through your mind knowing that you're going up from Springfield, all the success that you've had, and now you're up at the AAA level? Just everything I've heard about Memphis and the opportunity to be at the uh, next level and, and experience the player here and the level of play here. and the city of Memphis, which everybody speaks so highly about, and um, being able to, you know, kind of get awareness of different different um, overall experiences. What type of feedback do you get from the organization? What do they say to you? Well, you know, the interesting thing about our organization with the Cardinals is we have a pretty consistent continuity with messaging and, and what we want to message. And so nothing's really changed a whole lot in the fact of you know, we expect this or that out of you. I mean, inherently things are going to change a little bit. You're getting closer and there's going to be more of a relationship with the big league staff, the big league front office, and uh, the dynamic of how that looks like. But as far as the messaging and what we want to deliver to the guys in our clubhouse, um, that'll remain pretty consistent, just tempered based on their experiences. And of course, the relationship between the Cardinals and the Redbirds is very tight now because of the Cardinals taking over and, and, and owning this organization. You see all these changes happening to this beautiful ballpark, AutoZone Park, and I know you don't have a history here, and you know you just know a word of, of how great a, a stadium this has been. But with all these changes now, taking the tours, looking around, uh, what do you think about what's happening here, the renovations to AutoZone Park? It's it's like a rebirth of this stadium, which mm -hmm. is beautiful and has such a um, well-deserved reputation in minor league baseball and throughout the country of being one of, the, one of, if not the crown jewel facility in minor league baseball. But looking forward now and seeing what's taking place and the amount of um, energy effort and investment that's taking place in the stadium to make it even more user friendly, to, um, to show the community of Memphis that we, as an organization and the Memphis Redbirds want to make sure that they continue to have a top level first class experience and to see what's looking and taking place here is um, I'm thrilled to be a part of it because you can just feel the energy um, as you walk through the ballpark and you know Craig Unger and his staff have you know been here about a year now some right. guys have been here historically longer but a year under the current new um, organization and the partnership with the Cardinals and and you can just tell that there's, um, it's a first-class group and, and they're doing things in a first-class manner to best represent the city of Memphis and to allow them to um, provide a nice entertainment and, and uh, experience for the, for the fans, which is what we're here for. You have been successful. You have won championships at two different levels. What is the role of the minor league manager? Um, it's... it's there's a lot of different tentacles to that role. You know, you um, at a lower level, rookie level, 
it's as much as a um, somewhat degree of a father figure mm -hmm. because you've got guys that are just getting indoctrinated regardless whether they're coming from the States or the draft or a Latin American young man, but they're getting into the, in most cases, their first professional experience. So, and they're away from home and there's different things and travel and acclimation to the highest level they've ever played at. So it's a little bit of a um, father type figure. Generally it's, dealing with a younger with player. With a younger at player at the, at the rookie level. And then there's, there's a, a high volume of instruction going on. You know, a lot of them have played the game obviously, but it's a blank tablet for what we expect organizationally in execution of our fundamentals, our policies, just how we, we are standing operating procedures on and off the field. So it's a lot of teaching and um, trying to help guys develop good habits at, that, at those levels. Mm -hmm. uh, I looked up when I got to double A three years ago in 2012 and I said, you know, month goes by, what am I doing? The blank tablet's been mostly full. Guys can uh, understand what they need to do. They can self-evaluate. They're fundamentally pretty sound. They've got the organizational policies, fundamentals, the organization and the players have done a nice job of um, growing themselves. And, and so I looked up and like, well, what's going on here? How mm -hmm. am I helping these young men? And then I realized there was another aspect of it and that was the how to deal as they get closer to St. Louis and the expectations of, of being a player at the, at the big league level in, in St. Louis and, and how we do expect to compete for a world championship every year and what that looks like and how players at that level now are playing with very similar skill sets uh, and how they deal with the anxieties and the expectations, especially now there's even more uh, social media taking place, more exposure to the player um, and getting them to understand how to handle all that that comes at them. Um, so obviously it's in game management of the game, scheduling, putting forth uh, that every day, but it's also assisting these young young men and helping them, putting them in the best position to succeed and, and help them grow as uh, a complete player. Winning is the cherry on the top of the of the uh, ice cream sundae, which you've done. So, I mean, ultimately, you want to have a nice product out there for the fans, but you have to develop players. It's all about that big league team. And when you look at the Cardinals and all the success they've had, it's obviously working at the minor league levels. 100% about the big league team. You know, our, our parades at the end of the year, we want them to be in St. Louis. Um, it's nice to have a minor league championship. It does foster a winning expectation. Um, being able to play, the one thing we can't duplicate in minor league baseball, and it's not, it's relative speaking, but it is playing in a playoff setting, see how guys are gonna respond, see how guys are gonna react. I know it's been a benefit for the players that have come through our system that have had that opportunity and then get to St. Louis and then have the opportunity on the biggest stage. But it's not our primary. Uh, player development always takes to a, a secondary um, seat to what's taking place. Um, everybody likes to win. They put the scoreboard on for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest thing that we and, and we try to message and, and get across to our players is a winning effort every night, uh, learning how to play to win, a very process driven. I've never spoken to a club that I've had. And I, I don't recall hearing anybody speak within our organization about winning a particular game, more about the process of how you go about playing the game the right sure. way. You do that correctly and have the right process, the end result will be a, um, favorable. And if it's not, then you can, you can live with it. What about in-game managing? What type of a manager are you? You go through the history of baseball, and I remember Earl Weaver, get two on, knock that three-run home run out of the park. There's others that like to get players on base, move them around the bases get runs by speed. The Cardinals have been an organization that have done that over the years. What are you like, Mike? Well, um, interestingly enough, my style is somewhat dictated on the club that we have. Um, it's dictated a little bit on the experiences that we decide as an organization these players are, need, to, need to be provided. So as an example, some guys that typically you may think of trying to hit a through at home or may have to bunt in a certain situation. A situation may pinch hit for a lefty versus a lefty. He needs that a bat against the lefty. Um, so it's a little bit continued upon the roster, continued upon organizational philosophy. Um, and then beyond that is, uh, as you said, George Kissel was with us 68 years. Right. He'd always talk about um, having a toolbox. And you want to have a tool for as many situations as you can. Um, I like the way Gary LaRock, our farm director, uh, when he talks about evaluation of a player, he says, I want to know how that player is going to beat the other team. And so I, I use those things to the players and I use them in my own um, framework of how to think about developing an individual player. 
so they can have as many different ways to beat that other team as possible mm. and be able to reach in that toolbox. And if a player is has a tool that they like to use, that's great. We want to keep it sharp. We want to be there, but we want to be able to develop other tools that he can use. So when he gets in that situation, he can he can have it. So. From a managing standpoint. So a Swiss Army knife would be the best because you have a lot absolutely. of different things. You can <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, but you don't want to keep taking a knife fight uh, to a gunfight. Exactly. You know? and or so, a toothpick, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, from a manager standpoint, where you look at and you have the most consistent club is when you have flexibility within the game to make mm -hmm. different decisions based on what, what you need that particular day. Um, but don't get me wrong, I grew up in the Orioles double-A cl clubhouse as um, – doing a lot of different roles, keeping the scoreboard, washing the uniform, shining the shoes. So eight years wow. I, I grew up with the Orioles. And um, so that Earl Weaver philosophy of three, pitching defense and three in homer, you're not going to argue against that for me. You've done everything in really in baseball. You, you had your own I instructional uh, business mm -hmm. in North Carolina. You've coached at the college level. You've scouted with the Cardinals organization. Did you ever think you'd get to this point now? You're, you're, you're a step away from, from the bigs. You're getting to ask for advice from guys like Tony La Russa, a Hall of Fame manager. I mean, from where you were, like you said, shine and choose to where you are now. Is it a, just a dream come true? Completely dream come true, especially in this organization um, because it's such a well-respected, well-run organization. Um, I take my own advice in the, being process-driven. It's interesting. I don't allow myself to look back other than to reflect on how you can move forward. And so um, I have to look back and go, wait a minute, I'm going to manage the AAA team in Memphis for the St. Louis Cardinals. And it gets a little heady when you think about that from the journey that's taken place. But that's where it'll end for me because it's about the process. Mm -hmm. And I told myself when I first started to get into this professionally, I just want to go as far as I can to where I feel like I can contribute help young men become the best version of themselves, help an organization succeed. And like I said, I found a home in St. Louis. And um, it's not my, it's, it, as far as my career goes, it's completely not about me. It's about this right here, the birds on the bat. and The cardinal way, as the, they say. It's absolutely the cardinal way and the thing that resonates for me that um, not only with myself, but more importantly, the people that have mentored and shown me the way is people care more generally about the cardinal brand and the Cardinal um, being a caretaker of continued moving forward and, and providing excellence on and off the field then they care about their own careers and so um, I'm here at the greater good of the Cardinal organization and, and I'm fortunate to be in Memphis and excited and where that takes me beyond that is is really irrelevant to what's most important and it's, it's getting these guys in exactly and moving them forward to St. Louis. What has it meant to you to have somebody like Tony La Russa to ask questions to or to lean on Mike Matheny guys like that? It's been very heady. It's been very um, amazing, really, to think that um, Tony initially, when I was uh, able to work with him on a consistent basis uh, during his tenure here and be able to uh, coordinate minor league spring training for the last four years when he was a major league manager and work with his staff was, was uh, interesting. And I mentioned earlier that the first two years I did it, I was a little intimidated. My issue wasn't anything that Tony projected on me. Uh, to do anything other than just my initial job. And then finally in year three, I got the courage to, <laughs> to ask him some questions about um, managing or handling this, handling that, and he was, he was treating me like gold and, and really invested a lot of time and energy into, into me and, and making sure that I was able to grow. Mike Matheny has been outstanding as well. Um, I was able to start to get to know Mike when he was coming through our system, working with the catchers. And, and observing just a first-class human being and, and somebody who cares tremendously about people and the well-being of people, and he would take the time and invest in me. He was obviously doing with our players, and that's what makes him, that's one of the uh, traits that makes Mike such a tremendous big league manager. Um, he's, he's right out of central casting. He's got every absolute box you could check, and beyond that, he's been uh, tremendous to me and, and continues to, um, help me become the best version of me. So it speaks a lot about these guys. Yeah. Okay, you're off the hot seat, Mike, but we like to end all our interviews with something we call Five for the Road. So okay. first thing that comes to mind, five simple questions. Start it off, who is your favorite athlete of all time? Cal Ripken Jr. Okay, good choice. The Iron Man. 
I grew up with him. I grew up shining shoes in 1980, and he was 19 years old coming through playing for the AA team. And, um, you know, quick story is in 83 when they were in the World Series chase, I went up there and um, family's from Baltimore and went over to the clubhouse when they opened up with the White Sox. He was doing an interview with a gentleman, and uh, I was about to walk out of the clubhouse, and he stopped me, finished the interview, and introduced himself again to me and, and was engaged with me. The gentleman who was doing the interview was John Miller. Fast forward, um, they had a 20-year union from the 1980 team that he was on that won the Southern League Championship in 2000. He comes around the corner, and I see him, and he walks immediately over to him and says, Mike, how you doing? I see you. Remember who you were. I see you've grown into your feet because he always kid me I had big feet for my being such a little <laughs> kid. So, um, True gentleman, and it all came from, from Cal Sr. It all came from Cal Sr. No question. And, and his mother, of course. Yes. Uh, favor, so favorite pro team of all time, would it be the Orioles? Uh, it's going to be the Cardinals. Okay. It's got to be the Cardinals, okay. absolutely. Yeah. I'll, let, I'll let you have the Cardinals. Yeah. I shouldn't because you work for them. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, favorite music, musician, genre of music? What do you like to listen to? Um, I'm fairly flexible and, and have different tastes, but I would say my first concert, my favorite band is Journey. Journey? Yeah. How about that? Yeah. Well, you know you're now in the birthplace of rock and roll and the home of the blues. I am. I'm excited about uh, venturing right. out into that. Make sure you know that. Uh, favorite movie of all time? Hmm. Um, depending on the genre, first one that comes to mind is the Blues Brothers as a comedy. Um, but, you know, remember the Titans, uh, Miracle, Rudy. What's your favorite baseball um, picture? It's a tough one. I watched Bad News Bears over the no, offseason. No, not going there, are you? And uh, I realized that um, Walter Matthau and Boilermaker was a highly overrated manager. <laughs> if you look back on that club, how Kelly Leak didn't pitch, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> But I've probably got to say Field of Dreams. Okay, and then finally, favorite television show? Cheers. Cheers, no question. No question. Norm. Norm, Cliff, Coach. Yeah, Seinfeld is up there somewhere, but i got to go Cheers. Mike, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure having you on the show. We look forward to uh, dealing with you for many years to come. I look forward to it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mike. We'll yes, take sir. a short break. Overtime is coming up next. The Memphis Grizzlies are in Dallas tomorrow night, then back home Saturday night when they play host to Portland. And for all the fans who will be in attendance, they will be treated to first-class entertainment. And I'm talking about beyond the actual game itself. The Memphis Grizzlies game operations is second to none. And there are a lot of hardworking people who work tirelessly to put on a show each and every game. Everything you see from halftime guests to the Grizz girls to fan participation to the musicians. It's all part of the game day experience. It's the show within the show. Jason, I know it takes uh, a lot of people to put this on. I know it starts with you, though. Talk about the game ops and, and the entertainment and the fans just enjoying everything you guys do. What are your main responsibilities? My group is responsible for putting together the fan experience, as we like to consider it. So when you're here at FedEx Forum for a Grizzlies game, all the in-game entertainment. We work with our sponsorship team to activate our partnerships in-game. Uh, we work with everything from the audio, video th that the fans experience here to the entertainment teams on the floor, everything from Grizz the mascot, the Grizz girls, our claw crew, all of the player skits and videos you see in between the games. Basically, we kind of put on the circus here at the, at the games. How much is done before the season even kicks off to schedule things, to get acts for halftime, for the national anthem, all that before the season actually kicks off. Absolutely. That's one of the biggest questions we get is, what do you do in the off season? You know, you don't do anything, right? <laughs> and it is a year-round job. And the uh, when the schedule is released in August, things really kick up. So, I mean, we're booking things in beginning in August for the entire season in terms of halftime acts and thinking about some of the themes and promotional giveaways and things like that that we want to do. And uh, it's a rolling process. We work with the players before the start of the season, before training camp, to shoot all of the content with them and try to mine some of the things from them uh, from that point on. So it's, it's year-round. We get a lot of feedback from the fans, both via social media or people coming up, just engaging us, uh, season ticket holders that know who we are. And it's tremendous to get to understand what our audience wants and what they like. And 
personally being from Memphis uh, and several of my teammates that work with me being from Memphis, uh, we kind of have a sense of what we feel like the audience likes too when we're in doubt and we don't know what the, what the fans want. want. It, it, it tends to work out. It comes together pretty well. We're very lucky to have Rick and Joey, the faces that everybody gets to see here, but there are probably 100 people on the production every night from entertainers to the technical crew that, that don't get a chance. And, and it's, it's great for the fans to not know that any of us are here, that if it goes smooth and seamless, then, then we're all doing our jobs. But a lot of people put, a, put in a lot of time and effort and not only the planning, but the execution of all the games to give the fans what we believe is the best entertainment experience in the NBA and professional sports. Jason, thank you. Absolutely, Greg, thank you. Joey, how much fun is your job? Uh, it's actually too much fun. Uh, we always feel like we're getting away with something by being able to actually say that this is our job, you know, in heavy quotation marks that it's our job. It's one of those cliched things you hear it all the time. I'm sure you do working around athletes that, yeah, I come to work every day, but I'm not working. You know what I mean? Uh, it's it's incredible how much fun we get to have. I mean, look, at I'm in our office right now, so it's it's a lot of fun. I mean, we get to do this. This is people pay their good hard money to come to see where we play around every day yeah I talked to Jason about what it takes in the off season to get ready for the regular season but on a game-to-game -game basis or even a day-to-day -day basis there's a lot that goes into it a lot of strategizing figuring out what you're going to do to entertain the fans each game oh yeah without a doubt there's a lot of work that goes into every single game I was up till three in the morning planning this game and then I was took a couple hour nap and back up at it at 6 a.m. getting ready for today so you always have to be on your toes Obviously, you, you never know how a fan will react. Have you ever had some fan that reacted where you were just, what, what are you doing? Don't, what don't you understand about this, this skit we're doing here? Yeah, that, that happens a lot. Um, you know, to take people behind the curtain a little bit, a lot of the things that we do on court with, with fans, especially visiting team fans, it's fake for the general rule that we don't want to get burned. We don't want somebody to go out and, you know, try and make the show all about themselves. But, yeah, it happens from time to time. You know, we do our Battle Balls tournament, and, you know, we bring fans out here, and you never know what you're going to get when a fan comes out. They could just go rogue. Is there a uh, communication barrier when dealing with Grizz? How do, you, how do you communicate since he obviously doesn't speak? Human. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of hand signals. I can kind of tell by the way his head is shaking what he wants. Um, yeah, I try and stay on Grizz's good side for the most part. And it is a lot of people that put this on each and every game. And I would imagine that you have so much pride in what you do, you and the and the group, that you want to be not only the best each night for the fans, but you want to be the best in the NBA. We always say that we want to put on a uniquely Memphis show, but at the same time. We are representing the NBA. So, you know, people come here to a Memphis Grizzlies game. We never know. This could be their first game. This could be their first Grizzlies game or their first NBA game. And we want to represent that NBA experience. And, you know, it's you want to get the same show that you would hear as if you were going to a Broadway show somewhere else. You know, you, you want to get your money's worth. So. Hey, Joey, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. Rick, there is an absolute love affair between this community and you and what you do each and every Grizzlies game. Do you feel it from the fans? Oh, absolutely, man. And I think uh, Love Affair is, is accurate, man. I mean, uh, from social media to the grocery store to the bank line, I mean, I, I can barely go anywhere around this town without somebody recognizing me. I, it was McDonald's the last time. And the girl says, you're the guy from the Grizzlies. I say, yeah, she's got my debit card. And she says, I'm not going to give it back unless you say go go Grizzlies and stuff, you know. So there I'm in, in, in a drive through at McDonald's saying go Grizzlies. But uh, but it, it's, it's great. It's fun. It's great to be a part of. Definitely a different atmosphere from when I first got here and uh, and the team wasn't so good. So <laughs> It's pretty incredible the job that all you guys do with Game Ops and putting on a show for the fans because it's not just what the team does between the lines, it's what you guys do to entertain them and right now they're getting a big bang for their buck. Well, and, and we play a lot off of what goes on on the court. I mean, uh, Shot Clock Violated started, uh, I think, in a playoff series against Oklahoma City uh, a few years ago. You know, just as, the, as defense became the calling card for uh, our, our, our team uh, that season in particular, and uh, we got to the second round against OKC, and, uh, you know, we needed a stop, and uh, the crowd was on their feet, and the Grizzlies got that stop, and it just came out, and it, and it stuck, you know. <laughs> so It really has, and people will, will try to impersonate Rick Trotter, but it's more than just being behind the mic during the game. Pre-game with Joey, yeah. you've gotten really involved in that as well. Well, and I think that's what – puts a face with the voice uh, for a long time I've just been behind the microphone and in the last few seasons we've been able to do countdown and it's fun it's fun interacting with the fans that 
uh, arrive early and kind of give us a little warm up for the game. Uh, a lot of fans that come don't get to watch uh, Pete do pregame or, or you know things like that. So that this becomes their pregame show, and so we do a little uh, statistics and give them something to chew on as they think about the game. But it's also about entertainment and having a good time and getting ready to you know either uh, boo boo the opponent and, and cheer on our guys. So so we enjoy it a lot. It's great entertainment. You guys all do a fabulous job and, and keep up the good work, Rick. Thanks, Greg. All right. <laughs> And our thanks to the Grizzlies for allowing us to go behind the scenes of their game day operations. And that'll do it for now. Next week, I'll be joined by several members of the media as we dedicate the entire show wrapping up a very disappointing round ball season for the Memphis Tigers. Until then, have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO.